Here I go again, going through another strange out there category. We're still not doing vampires, we're still not doing zombies. We're doing evil genies, or djinn, or whatever you want to call them. We're going to go through the history of some of the most noteworthy genie or djinn horror films, and I'm going to try to find what I think is the best one. I think when most people think genie horror films, the first series that comes to mind is The Wishmaster. I do like The Wishmaster series, but I don't think I like it quite as much as everyone else does. I've only seen the first two admittedly, but I see no reason to go further as two was already unnecessary as it is. The first one is a cool and unique film, and it's basically all made by special effects artists who worked on all the masterpiece slasher movies of the 80s and 90s. So they get to go crazy with the special effects, and they have some really creative kills in the movie. I know a lot of people like the Kane Hodder stained glass death in the movie, but I kind of always found the one to look... The effect looks pretty cheap and weird, and the death is just kind of silly. I don't know, I never really found that one very effective, to be totally honest. The kill I personally feel is the best is Tony Todd's of Candyman fame, where he ends up in a Houdini-style water tank trap in the middle of the sidewalk. Drowning already seems like that's the worst way to go, like just such a slow and panicky and terrible death <laughs> to me personally, but when you add that it's just happening in the middle of public, like out in front of everybody in the middle of a city and no one can stop it, there's an added element of just like creepiness to it there and it makes it even more claustrophobic somehow there are some other cool effects like all the stone warriors who come to life later on in the film and uh the overall look of the djinn is actually really badass but unfortunately the film as a whole is kind of just stock to me it's kind of like they took a bunch of insanely creative ideas and threw them into the most stock generic horror script ever written Unfortunately, the biggest draw for the film is the special effects and all the cameos from like Robert England and Kane Hodder and all the other slasher stars. Also, I'm sorry, but I don't find Andrew Divoff or Divoff or I actually don't know how you say his name uh, as the Jin to be very good. He's super hammy, which is fine if done right, like Wes Craven's other magical killer, Freddy. Unfortunately, I just find Andrew's voice is too silly. It's like, it's too hard for me to pretend that it's intimidating. Like, the, the way he talks, the faces he makes, the voice he makes, it's all so cartoony and childish, unfortunately, that I find it just too much to get past, even for such a silly premise for a film. Again, it's not a bad film. I think it's actually damn good. I just don't think it's quite on par with what its fans seem to say it's at. It seems the people who like this movie really like this movie. And I see the appeal. Again, like it's kind of a celebration of like slasher special effects and horror special effects. But I just don't think it's as amazing as people say. As a movie, if you just look at the script and stuff, it is incredibly generic and lackluster. Let's go back to 1987 with The Outing, or as it's better known everywhere else in the world other than America, The Lamp, because that's what the movie's all about. The Outing sounds like it's a camping trip gone wrong film, which I, I guess it kinda is. Now I'm gonna run down the plot of this one, because unlike Wishmaster, I think a lot of people haven't seen this movie, and for good reason. It starts with some punks who are terrible actors hamming it the hell up, who break into some elderly woman's house, murder her, steal a lamp, then a djinn gets out and kills them all. I wish I could say it's where the movie ends, but unfortunately it's just getting started. We're then introduced to our main characters, a dad who looks like a discount Lance Hendrickson, and his daughter, Alex, who is dressed like Boy George for some reason. She then finds some bracelet that came with the lamp, and she puts it on, and she kind of on and off starts getting obsessed with the lamp and the, the, the gin and everything, but it's kind of just, like, convenient for the... Whatever it's convenient for the plot, she starts obsessing over the lamp and, uh, and genies and stuff, and when it's not, she just goes back to being her regular self. But then we get treated to how bad the characters really are in this movie. We're treated to some, uh 
we were introduced to some over-the-top bully twins. Uh, one of the twins used to date her, but she dumped them, so now he's just out to try to ruin her life. And uh, we're given all this information in the most unnatural exposition dumps ever. From now on, I'm just going to call these two the Bully Brothers. Anybody else grow up with that book, The Bully Brothers Trick the Tooth Fairy? Good kids book. Make the main characters bullies trying to scam somebody out of money. So we got to talk about the school fight. When they get to school, this crazy fight breaks out between the boyfriend and the bully brothers. One of the bullies pulls out a knife, then some teacher comes along who looks younger than all the students, by the way. She pulls out a freaking bow staff and beats the shit out of the bully. Immediately, the principal shows up with two cops in the school and has the bully kid arrested. And the, the bully kid was already arrested in the last scene when he started a car accident. So. In this one morning, this bully kid has somehow already been arrested twice. I don't know how this universe works. Bo Staff Teacher is an awful, awful actress. And apparently she's had like a fling with the uh, bootleg Lance Hendrickson character, the dad of the main girl. The dad, by the way, works at a museum where he keeps the lamp. And conveniently, the school takes a class trip like halfway through the school day to that same museum. The main cast of kids decide they're gonna sleep in the museum, sneak in there overnight. Alex sneaks off to the office where the lamp is being held and whoops, what do you know, she unlocks the gin. It's also worth noting there are a ton of up-close shots of faces that are not even in focus in this movie. They also constantly try to do the Evil Dead camera trick, you know, where it's like zooming through and you never see what's actually running through. Uh, they try to pull this off, but you can see the shadow of the cameraman on the walls as they're trying to pull it off, so it kills the entire effect. Side note, there's a security guard who is a weirdly good singer. But anyway... The Bully Brothers sneak in as well into the museum, and they're trying to play pranks on the kids, not realizing that some evil genie is killing them all off one by one. One guy gets ripped in half, uh, his girlfriend gets killed by cobras, then one of their friends come in and cries over the dead girl's body, but then they get bit by cobras too. Somehow, in the next shot, the girl is way in the background beyond the ripped in half guy, so... How did he just not see the ripped in half guy before the girl? Or did he just not care about the guy? Like, he would have had to have passed the ripped in half guy to get to the girl to see she was killed by Cobra. Cur whatever. Whatever. The girlfriend of the guy who just got killed by the snakes finds, like, some Asian Princess Leia slave outfit and puts it on. Then the Bully Brothers come in, and uh, one of them tries to rape her, while the other one just stands there and watches like he's his butler or something. But then the genie comes in and kills them with the masks they were just wearing. So, at least they get their comeuppance. I guess the genie's at least fair. We actually get some mummy action in this movie. To go back to mummy movies, as I said, there's a lot of movies that have mummy scenes that aren't mummy movies. But we get some pretty good mummy action here when the djinn uh, possesses the mummy and it bites the boyfriend to death. Yes, the main girl's boyfriend actually dies. And uh, you can actually see in one shot that they actually put the wrong feet on the wrong legs of uh, the, the, the mummy prop. But aside from that, I do have to say, it's actually one of the best effects in the movie. The mummy actually looks pretty damn good. Speaking of good effects, though, when you finally do see the genie, he's pretty good, actually. It's a pretty good effect, albeit, you know, a bit stiff and limited in the movement. But they keep him in the shadows so you don't see how bad the suit looks usually or how bad the, the animatronic looks. For the most part, it looks pretty good. The daughter remembers that earlier in the film, really harshly for whatever reason, to her dad, she just tells him she wishes he was dead, even though he seems like the nicest dad in the world. She just tells him, like, I wish you were dead at some scene earlier, and then says, like, I'm sorry a little bit afterwards. But she remembers she did that in front of the lamp, so she's like, oh, okay, that's why the genie is killing all these people who aren't my dad? Like, it's supposed to explain why the genie murdered everybody, because she wished for her dad to die, but it's like... None of those were your dad. Why Why did they die? That doesn't make any sense. If anything, this should be confusing her more. It's like, oh, wait, I wished for my dad to die, but everyone who isn't my dad is dying. So it's kind of weird. It's supposed to be like a big revelation scene, but it doesn't really work. 
The dad does some 80s computer magic nonsense to find out how to kill a jinn, because, you know, any computer in the 80s has locked somewhere inside of it is the information of how to kill a jinn. And as he's doing this, the jinn is, like, pounding on the door. And actually, like, we see it break through the door, like, five separate times, but somehow it just keeps resetting and it never gets through. And it's also worth noting that earlier in the film, it's been established that the jinn can possess, like, any object so why can't it just get through the door why can't it just possess the door why can't it just possess the whole room and collapse in on them or something it makes no sense how now it just has to run after them like a big dumb monster the computer tells the dad that the only way to kill the genie is to kill the lamb destroy the lamb so alex throws it in the fire and it is not destroyed at all we get multiple close-up shots showing that it is completely intact and the fire is not affecting it in any way shape or form but somehow this counts and the genie dies uh, I, I guess you don't have to destroy the lamp you just have to make it uh uncomfortable and unpleasant to live in maybe it was too hot and he didn't want to live there anymore i don't know there's a really weird moment at the end where the cops are going to drive her home uh, she tells him to stop, stares at a guy unloading Pepsi from a Pepsi truck for a bit, then tells him to drive, makes a weird face at the camera, and the movie just freezes awkwardly on it. I have no idea what that's about. Are the bottles bothering her? Like, it reminds her of the genie, but this genie didn't come out of a bottle. This genie came out of a lamp, so it's not clever it's not like clever imagery I, I don't get it does she hate pepsi like what is this ending this movie is awful it's a lot of fun it's funny to laugh at uh it fluctuates because it's usually really funny but then they throw in weird disturbing stuff like rape so it's kind of it's kind of like uncomfortable in that way but it's a pretty fun like stupid just watch it with a bunch of friends and have a good time kind of harder movie but it's definitely, definitely not a good film. Now, sometimes we get movies based on like the monkey paw idea, which yes, I know that's not actually a, a genie. It's still kind of the same thing. It's the whole be careful what you wish for kind of thing. Um, and that's where we get movies like Wish Upon. It's awful. I actually first saw it when a friend of mine, Jake, showed it to me prior to having any context of the negative reputation it has. I understand it's been reviewed by a lot of big YouTube channels like Ralph the Movie Maker and YMS and stuff, and it has a pretty good reputation of being garbage, but I didn't know any of that going into it. It was just like, okay, let's watch a random bad horror movie. One of the biggest problems with this movie, well... <laughs> There's a lot of problems with this movie. One of the biggest ones I can think of is none of its characters are likable. They're all inexcusably stupid and selfish, and you're, you're just not rooting for anyone. The writing is just outright terrible. Any script that tries to imply chemistry and history between two characters through a discussion about one of them farting in school for five minutes should be thrown in the trash before the cameras even roll. Now, the movie may be bad, like really bad, but it's hilariously bad and high on entertainment value, I'm not gonna lie. I can't hate any movie that brought us lines like, I think you're a selfish bowl of bitch sauce. I don't think this was even written by human beings. They have no idea how human beings act and talk. No, one thing I don't find funny is the dog dying. Even if they undo it later in the movie, I still don't like it being in there. But I think I have to address that. So years ago, I made a movie that was uh, my entire retrospective on the Halloween franchise. And I got a comment from somebody who was angry that I said I didn't like it when dogs die in, in horror films. That I, it makes me angry to watch you know, dogs die in horror films. And they're like, I don't get it. Like, uh, you know, innocent humans die all the time in these movies. Why do people get so mad about dogs dying? So I guess I have to explain that to a certain degree. Um, I mean, a, a dog doesn't, like, ask to be part of our society, like, they don't know what's going on, they don't know, oh, this is a killer coming after me, like, they're just these purely innocent creatures that are just unconditionally love us. Like, the do a dog is, like, the ultimate symbol of everything pure and wonderful and loving in this world, and I just don't want to see something like that killed. You know, obviously I don't want to watch innocent people die, but there is a, I can make a disconnect for, for fiction with humans dying. I can't really make that disconnect for dogs. It still bothers me. Where, uh, you know, 
watching humans die in fiction can be entertaining and funny and all because human beings piss every one of us off on a daily basis. I'm not saying we want anyone to die, we don't, but we take pleasure in venting our anger at them for all the crap they put us through by watching horrible things happen to them in movies. It can be funny and stress relieving to watch that. And also it's like humans are making dumb decisions, getting themselves into these situations. If a human sees a guy with a mask coming after them with a knife, they know to get the hell away from that guy. A dog doesn't. I don't think a killer proves themselves as being scary or badass by killing something that's completely oblivious and defenseless to this situation. So that's really why I just don't like it. It just, I, it just doesn't sit right for me. I don't know, I don't like seeing dogs die. I'm sorry. You can disagree if you want, but that's just how I feel. But yes, Wish Upon is complete garbage, but it's entertainingly bad. It's actually become like a running gag between me and my friend Jake that anytime we watch some truly bad crap together, which we do way too often, uh, we constantly find ourselves saying, I miss Wish Upon. I miss Wish Upon has kind of just become a running gag for us. Because it's like, we've sunken so low, it's now a standard we hope to get back to. Which is, which is pretty sad. You haven't seen truly painful, torture tool films that bring no joy or entertainment to you whatsoever until you've seen anger-inducing trash like Vicious Lips or Girls with Balls. Oddly enough, genie horror films are actually much more common today than they were in the past. There's almost none if you go back into the 20th century. So let's fast forward to 2013 to look at Gin by Toby Hooper. Yes, that Toby Hooper. Responsible for such horror classics as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Poltergeist, and a slew of other great flicks like Life Force, Salem's Lot, and the remake of Invaders from Mars. But when you remember he had involvement in every Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie in his lifetime, unfortunately reminded that his name is not necessarily a guaranteed mark of quality. However, I can't really imagine he's too attached to this. It seems like he wasn't very invested in it. It's more like this very small indie film that just went out of its way to try to get Toby Hooper as some form of credibility for their project. But he, maybe he was all in on it. I actually don't know for sure. The movie isn't flat out terrible. I'll just say that up front. It's not like a an objectively bad movie. It's just kind of flat and unmemorable and not very special. Uh, it also doesn't really rely on like the genie tropes. It's not about like wishes or anything. The whole be careful what you wish for message is not there. It's more like kind of like a generic horror haunting ghost kind of thing. Just it's about a djinn. It's actually got a lot of uh, Rosemary's Baby or uh, The Omen in it. It feels kind of like it's copying those while they're also copying a lot of uh, haunting films. The movie actually kind of jumps back and forth between being in English and being in Arabic, but uh, while it seems very random, characters just sometimes speak in English and sometimes speak in Arabic with really no real you know, creative reason as to why they do it. They just kind of jump back and forth. At least there's always subtitles in English for the Arabic speaking scenes. There is a depiction of an American guy at the beginning of the movie though, and it is so over the top and on the nose. I really hope that this is not how other people in the world view us, cause I'd be ashamed. This guy sucks ass. The setting is actually really cool and really unique in this movie though, I will say. It, it takes place in this giant like high rise building. It's super high end, super modern, while also looking very like ancient and temple like. So it creates kind of this cool, cold, isolated feel while also creating this like ancient haunted kind of feel, which works very well. It feels like there's a lot of like history in this while it also being a brand new building. Uh, also the building's surrounded in this super thick white fog. You can't see like an inch in front of you. Everything is just hidden in a sea of fog, sort of like the house in the others, which I think also creates a really cool effect. It makes you feel even more isolated and more claustrophobic. I'm not usually one to get mad at movies, horror movies specifically, when characters make bad choices. I know some people judge a horror movie on whether or not the character makes good or bad choices. Horror movies aren't survival guides. If everyone made the best choices, you wouldn't get horror movies. So I don't usually hate that, but there is a line I draw. There's a point in this movie where it's just mind-bogglingly stupid, where the male protagonist 
is, you know, all the hauntings going on. Everything's going crazy. It's like terror ground zero inside this building. He finally gets down to the lobby and gets outside of the building and calls the cops. And then when the cops arrive, he's back in the building. He went back in the lobby. And now he's like, like, oh, no, wait, let me go out and see them. And he can't get out. And he's like freaking out. Like, why can't they see me? Because they see it as apparently the building's not even open yet. It's like all, you know, still under construction. They don't even see him inside the glass. But it's like, dude, why did you go back? back in there you can argue that he was uh never out of the building that it's all part of the illusion that the uh you know the villain is making um but the thing is when it shoots back to him and he's in the building again he's totally normal he's totally calm he's just hanging out in the lobby and then tries to step outside when the cops get there so it's like he wasn't acting weirded out that he was back in the building he like voluntarily went back in the building even though he knows all this horrible crap is going down in there the movie's kind of just all over the place too it has a very scatterbrained pace where for most of the movie the female lead is our main protagonist is who we're following in the film but then all of a sudden, like the third act, the male lead becomes the main protagonist and who we're following. It just kind of seems that they gave all the character development scenes to the female character, but then they do the big action escape scene with the male character where like there's not like this any time given for us to grow with these two characters, learn their relationship. And then when like the conflict between them happens, it just doesn't really affect us very much because we don't really know them as a couple. We really just followed her being spooked the entire movie. It's not like the worst movie. I think you can get some enjoyment out of it, even though it's not really about the djinn, it's more about this like evil witch woman. I forgot to mention her earlier in the film. She's actually like, the main villain. She's been snooping around, trying to seduce the husband, and just being an all-around bowl of bitch sauce. It, it doesn't really do anything unique you can't see done better in other movies, so I can't recommend it really at all. But if you watch it, you probably won't be that disappointed. You're not going to get angry at this movie. Well, we just talked about Jin from 2013. What about The Djinn from 2021? This is clearly a very low-budget, small-scale indie project. It takes place almost entirely in one apartment household, but I do have to say the movie actually does really well with uh, the scale and the budget that it has. It, it does a lot with the little that it has. It's mostly like a simple haunting slash survival film with our main child star played by the surprisingly talented Ezra Dewey trying to survive in an hour locked in a house with a djinn. The djinn takes mortal forms as it stalks him and tries to kill him. The boy in the film can't speak, but he longs to, he really wants to. Uh, he feels like, he has all this guilt where he feels like he could have stopped his mother who committed suicide had he been able to speak, or he thinks at least she would have killed herself if she had a normal child who could speak, a quote-unquote normal child. He thinks that you know, he's the reason she killed herself, or he wasn't able to stop her from killing herself because of what he sees as his flaw. He lives with a really lovable dad character, just seems like a really nice, loving father who works as a radio DJ, but uh, there really isn't too much reason for the movie to take place in the 1980s. I feel like they just did that to make a... Uh, they have a lack of outside communication with the world and have kind of more of a more believable threat. It's kind of hard to do these kinds of stories in modern times with how easy it is to contact people in a, a regular household today. They also try to put in a lot of that new fake like wannabe 80s synth music that's like really big these days that it's trying to, you know, channel like John Carpenter and stuff like that, where it doesn't really sound like 80s music. It sounds like modern music inspired by 80s music, but we're supposed to believe it's like 80s music. Uh, they put that in and it, it doesn't do much to make it feel like it's the 80s, but uh, it does a lot for giving the uh, movie sort of a unique identity uh, musically. It has sort of like this weird synth soundtrack, which kind of works as a unique identity for the film. And I do appreciate the movie isn't constantly just shoving the 80s in your face. Like I said, like it really doesn't need to be the 80s outside of the technology being older. Aside from that, there's not like He-Man posters everywhere and Rubik's Cubes hanging from the ceiling or anything. It's not like the Goldbergs or something. The plot is definitely a bit rushed and very convenient, uh, but the movie's really not about 
the lore or the plot or anything. You know, it, it's very convenient how he just finds the Book of Shadows in a closet in his house with all these spells and finds a spell to grant a wish, but it summons a djinn. And if you survive an hour with the djinn in your house, then your wish will be granted. But it's kind of a monkey's paw thing. Uh, and then, like, if you survive the hour, you have to put out the candle you lit for the ceremony, which will stop the ritual, and the djinn will go away, and your wish will be granted. It's all very rushed, and, like, there's no real focus on, like, building up the lore. Like I said, he just finds the Book of Shadows in a closet in his house, which is like, yeah, that's pretty silly, but that's not really what the movie's about. It's really just a setup so that we can get this, you know, cool survival story and this sort of interesting look into this character. The Jin's true design is rarely seen, which is smart since it's such a low-budget movie. I think it was wise to not try to, you know, make a scary, creepy figure that you see everywhere. So when you do see it, it's simple, but it's effective. I think it works. But the Jin mostly appears in uh, the form of mortal forms of human beings that the boy has pictures of in his apartment or memories of, even like his deceased mother. The boy's acting cannot be dismissed. He does an excellent job, not only only by being like the only lone star really of the movie, almost the only actor in the entire film, but he does it without even speaking. It's all in his face and his body language and his reactions and his emotions, and he just does such an excellent job. Also, his crying is so much more convincing than the adult star of our last film, uh, Jin from 2013, where they have her cry so much, but she's so bad at faking it, and her face is always bone dry. She looks like she just walked off of a Victoria's Secrets photo shoot. Like, her mom tells her, like, go clean up your face after she cries. But it's like, her face looks fine. Her face looks better than your average person's face. She does not look like she cried at all. She is bone dry. Makeup's totally fine. Nothing's ruined. I don't want to all out spoil the ending, but I'll let you know it is a real downer. Uh, just in advance, I'll let you know that it's not a happy ending. It's not like the worst movie ever, like the biggest downer of an ending, but it's a major downer, uh, especially when you consider how the consequences are going to affect the lifestyles of the characters. I wouldn't say The Djinn is a movie I'm like over the moon about, like some of the other previous winners for The Search of the Spookiest, like Night Tide or Sphere or The Lair of the White Worm. But I would comfortably say it is the best horror movie about a djinn. It follows the whole be careful what you wish for story so you get that action, but then it's also just a solid survival horror film. And it's really well shot, you know, it's, it's very professionally done for such a low budget movie. And at under an hour and a half, yet still getting across just as much as most modern movies that are over three hours do, that is so sweet. That is such a sweet time frame. An hour and a half. Less than an hour and a half. You can't go wrong. I mean, why not watch this movie? I think it's very solid, especially very admirable for clearly what a low budget it had. So I hope you enjoyed my Terrors from the Tomb trilogy. You know, we had Fathoms of Fear last year with the Mermaid movies, Gill Men movies, and Sea Monsters movies. This year I did uh, Terrors from the Tomb, which was Mummy movies, Snake People movies, and Genie movies. I'm going to be doing more of these very soon, actually, and we're going to be getting into some much more major, famous, popular horror monsters, because, come on, guys, Halloween's coming, so I gotta do some more of these, and I gotta do some of the big ones, finally. So, I hope you enjoyed this, I hope you look forward to more of mine, I know these aren't my biggest videos, but, you know, I'm going to keep doing them. I'm going to do as many as I want to do originally. And, you know, they may pick up steam over time or they might not, but I'll just be happy knowing I did. So hopefully you look forward to more of the search for the spookiest. And in the meantime, stay spooky. Do all the liking and subscribing and the sharing and the bell stuff. <laughs>